it's been a really long time since my last video and uh, as some of you may know I was in vacation for a month even though I posted a couple of videos during my vacation but I had some raw footage before that but uh, even though I was in vacation the work on my car didn't stop uh, car was kept uh, working on it so he buffed it and polished it uh, so nice that I couldn't even recognize it when I came home as you can see it's so nice and shiny that's uh, what it looks like after my vacation and that's how I saw it when I came back I really appreciate it Carlos thank, thank you so much man it's uh, getting ready now for the British car day uh, which is uh, just in a week and uh, the car is almost ready it's missing just a little thing a couple of things uh, but from the exterior it's missing this front valance here as you can see and uh, the car was still working on it it is here on his bench he's working on it uh, uh, for the last uh, couple of hours but now I want to bring you back in the time and uh, show you how the misfire on the engine got fixed. Okay, so <clears throat> I love working in my car because I can sit on the tire. Now that uh, all the lights and everything are connected, I'd like to take it on a road test. So um, I'm going to take care of the engine now, even though I still haven't finished with the interior and stuff, I still have things to do, but I'm, I want now to make it drivable, so I'm going to adjust the rockers, I'm going to ch change the spark plugs, I'm going to change the contact points, I'm going to rebuild the carburetors, and I'm going to ask Carlos to tune them up for me. And then, when it's drivable already, I'm going to take it on a road test, and hopefully if everything is fine I'm gonna finish uh, the interior and I'm gonna get it ready for the car show in September according to the menu the gap on both uh, exhaust and intake valves must be 0.25 millimeters so I adjusted all the valves to this uh, gap Next I'm going to change the contact points and I'll adjust the gap. These aftermarket contact points are not good at all because they come into separate parts and uh, the only thing that holds the end of the wires both from the ignition coil and from the capacitor uh, is the pressure of the spring which is a little bit uh, not safe if you ask me but anyways Okay, this capacitor is new, I changed it before I started taking the car apart. So now that I changed the contact points, everything is new in the distributor. Okay, so now I have to adjust the gap. The gap needs to be between 0 0.36 and 0 0.41 millimeters. Now I'm gonna turn the engine to the point where the contact points are fully open, which is here. And now I'm gonna adjust the gap to be 0 0.4.
So I've got brand new spark plugs here. The gap needs to be uh, around 0 0.64 for the spark plugs. So I'm going to double check the gap here. Okay, that's good. Okay, with the new all the new ignition components, even the um, ignition coil with new. So I'm putting a new rotor here. Okay. The distributor cap is new. The old one was cracked, that's why I changed it before I uh, took the car apart. Okay. And of course, new cables. The old ones are going away. And so now I have a longer cable for the ignition coil, so I can move it back now. Before it was, I had to put it so much forward because the cable wasn't long enough. So I can adjust it now. Even though the carbs are still not rebuilt, I'm going to try to start the car to see if the ignition system is okay. Because I know that with the carbs adjusted as they are now, the car was starting, so if it doesn't start now, I will know that something is wrong with the ignition. If it starts and then it, and it still uh, uh, misfires, then I'm going to continue with the carbs. to go ahead and rebuild the carbs. Uh, I took them apart once upon a time and I cleaned them but I didn't have the rebuild kit at that time so I just put them back together so I can uh, test drive the car but now I'm taking them apart and I'm changing all the, uh, the jets, the needles, the, all the seals and everything that comes in the rebuilding kit. So once I rebuilt the curves, I decided to give the car a test ride and I was pretty sure that everything was going to be fine this time, but to my surprise, it was still inspiring badly. So I had no other option but to wait a couple more days for Carlos to find some time and work with me on my car. And he did so. I didn't take video of that unfortunately, but what he did was uh, he took apart all the carbs once, one more time and uh, he put them together himself, he changed the needles and uh, jet back to uh, the original ones because he didn't like the ones that I got uh, with the rebuild kit. Uh, he adjusted a little bit the uh, carbs, not too much, and then uh, 
he said it seemed like the car ran on uh, three cylinders. So he started taking out uh, the cables out from the distributor and from my surprise when he pulled out the second uh, cable and the car didn't change at all even though there was a spark. So he said you see this uh, cylinder is not running which was really funny. He put it back on, he pulled out the third one and the car was still running the same way as it was running before. There was absolutely no change. So actually it appeared that the car was running on two cylinders, not even in three. So then it was very easy to figure out that the cables on the second and third cylinders were switched. So he just switched them the other way and the car started running perfectly. So all that time, ever since I bought the car, the first thing I did when I, when I started disassembling it was to write down the firing order. I put it in my notebook and I had it as 1, 2, 4, 3 instead of 1, 3, 4, 2. But it appears that the previous owner had it wrong and ever since I bought the car I kept it the same way and I was running it always on two cylinders. This is really a big surprise for me that the car can run in only two cylinders but it does and you see it runs and it drives just there is this misfire. So after Carl did the magic this is what the car sounds like. still need to be tuned up and Carlos did that at a later time before I took the car to the car show but here the most important part is that the misfire is gone and the engine runs much smoother than before. It's much better to use all the four cylinders instead of two, right? <laughs> Especially when the car is designed to use four cylinders. <laughs> Now, if you remember from one of the previous episodes, I uh, had to order new brakes uh, master cylinder because I cracked my old one and temporarily I put a uh, clutch master cylinder but it's, it's not even from uh, Spitfire because in the Spitfire the clutch and the brakes master cylinders are uh, exactly the same but this clutch master cylinder is from uh, tier 4 or tier 6 Anyways, it uh, did a good job for a couple of uh, weeks or even a month, I think. Uh, but now I'm switching it back to my uh, to a normal brakes master cylinder because it has a longer travel on the on the piston, and now my pedal can go all the way up. Before the brakes pedal wasn't going all the way up, and uh, it wasn't turning off the rear brake lights. But anyways, now I just switched it back to what it was supposed to be and of course I had to beat the system again. Another bug that uh, was bothering me for a long time was the, was the temperature gauge. As you see, it was always uh, below zero and a fuel level gauge too, but that wasn't so important for me. The temperature gauge is very important, as you know. So it was sitting always at zero and uh, I thought it was the sensor on the housing for the thermostat. So I changed that, 
but this didn't help at all. And then later on I noticed that actually the gauge does move, but it moves uh, just when I turn the ignition on, it goes up and then uh, it sits there for a couple of seconds, like uh, maybe on 30 or 40 degree, and then it goes back below zero. Same happens with the uh, fuel level gauge. When I turn the ignition on, it goes up just a little bit, and then it goes back to zero. So I read a little bit about this uh, issue and uh, what I figured out is that this is the piece here that's the voltage stabilizer which is getting power directly from the fuse and obviously it's uh, grounded here and the 12 volts or 13 or 14 volts that are coming here depending on the alternator and on the conditions of the electrical system in this specific moment it transforms this 12, 13 or 14 volts into 10 volts on this side and then it sends 10 volts to the temperature gauge and to the fuel level gauge which are grounded on the other side obviously so I'm guessing that this piece is not good because I measured the output on mine and it's 12 volts so that's uh, what's wrong I'm guessing because these two they need permanently 12, uh, 10 volts otherwise depending on the on the voltage that's coming out of the alternator they're gonna show different levels which is gonna be wrong they need to be steady at 10 volts so I'm gonna change the voltage stabilizer now and I'm gonna see hopefully everything is gonna be okay it was gonna be much easier to change it before I installed the glove box but anyways I managed to change it and while the engine was still warm I wanted to check if it was going to show the real temperature. Well, not success at all. So, uh, even with the new voltage stabilizer, I'm still back in uh, square one. So I have to take it out. Okay, so I took it off and decided to check, uh, to bench test it, 12 volt to B, and that's my voltage meter on I, and it shows me 349 without ground, it's not grounded, so let me ground it, nothing changes, and it's supposed to give me 10 volts. Okay, so even the new one is not good. Okay, so obviously I had to go back to my old uh, voltage stabilizer and try and see what was wrong with it. So I went online and I checked how it works and uh, it works like a switch with a bimetallic strip inside. So when it has a load on it, it uh, becomes a little bit hot and then the bimetallic strip bends and uh, interrupts the circuit. When it gets cold again, it closes the circuit again and so on and so forth. So obviously when the circuit is closed we have uh, 12 or 13 volts or even 14 sometimes and uh, when the circuit is open of course we have zero. So depending on the load, the bimetallic strip opens and closes at different times but always it stays open or closed as long as it's needed to average the voltage between 0 and 12 at 10 volts. My, with, with my English I can't explain it better but uh, I hope that makes sense. So what I decided to do with mine was I drilled just a little hole in it and I sprayed uh, WD-40 inside because all mechanical parts get rusty, you know. So I sprayed a little bit of WD-40 inside, I waited a little bit and then I went ahead and checked it again. In the beginning it gave me 12 volts again, but that was because there was no load. As soon as I put my test light there, it acted as a load and uh, it started uh, 
heating up, let's say, the bimetallic strip, and then the circuit got broken, and then it got uh, connected again, and then broken again, and you can see on the voltmeter, the voltage goes up and down, up and down all the time, depending on the fact if the circuit is open or closed. And also you can see the light on the test light is turning red or green again when the circuit is closed it shows me red when the circuit is broken it shows me green so obviously the voltage stabilizer started working the only thing is i'm not sure about the voltage average because uh, with this digital uh, voltmeter i cannot see where it averages but uh, if i had the mechanical one i would be able to see that but anyways, I'm, I'm going to put the voltage stabilizer in the car and I'm going to check. Hopefully everything is going to be fine now. Yikes! It works! So, that was easy. Well, that's everything for this episode. But don't forget to stay tuned for the next one when I think I'm going to be able to take you to the British Car Day in... Uh, Oakville, Ontario, which is the biggest British car show in North America. <laughs>